Hi, this is Mike from Connected German here with another instructional video. Today we're looking at part one of a series on cases in German. We're going to explain what cases are and how they're used. All of these videos range from beginner all the way up to advanced. This first one though, part one, describes the first way that cases are used in German. It's intended for beginners, so if you don't have a whole lot of experience with German, this would be the right place to start. So let's get started. The first way that we can use cases in German to describe case is essentially just another way to look at the role that a certain word plays in a sentence. Um, going back to grammar, and this might hit on some of the stuff that you learned back in grade school, um, but to kind of rehash here, um, yeah, cases essentially define what role a word can play. Specifically, we're looking at nouns and pronouns. This video looks exclusively at nouns. And yes, I'm sorry to bring it up again, but in case you don't remember this stuff from fourth and fifth grade, uh, we're going to be looking again what a subject is, what a direct object, and what an indirect object is. Essentially, these different roles in the sentence are what make up different cases. You have a case in German for each one of these roles. So let's get started first with an example in English. Uh, the boy sees the pencil on the table. We can see that the subject is boy. The pencil is our direct object. On the table, our prepositional phrase, is our indirect object. And just to kind of rehash what exactly subject, direct object, and indirect object mean. Subject is the doer or the focus of the sentence. Clearly, it's the boy seeing the pencil. The pencil is the direct object. It's the thing that's involved, but it's not really doing anything. It happens to be seen by the boy. It doesn't have a choice. It's just there as the direct object. And usually the indirect object, which is on the table here, um, usually describes uh, time, manner, or place. And we're going to be dealing mainly with the subject and the object for today. Now really why we want to define these is because we want to distinguish who is doing what. It's clear in English because of word order. We always put the subject before the direct object and then the indirect object in that order. Very rarely do we break from that. And that's how we know, if I give you the sentence again, the boy sees the pencil on the table. The boy is the one seeing, never mind the fact that a pencil doesn't see. The subject comes before the direct object. But if you don't have that fixed word order in other languages like German, you, then you're going to need some way to mark what is the subject, what is the object. Let me give you an example in German of how this works. Still working with the verb seeing. Der Junge sieht den Hund. The boy sees the dog. So here, der Junge, which is the boy, it's the subject of the sentence. Den Hund, the dog, is our direct object. The boy is the one that's seeing the dog, not the other way around. And how do we know that? Well, if we look a little bit at these articles and a little bit at these genders, both the word Junge, boy, and Hund, dog, are masculine. You just take my word for it. And the articles Der and Den show us this. However, why are they different? Why is it Der in one case and Den in another? It's because they're showing two different roles in the sentence. Again, Junge is masculine, Hund is masculine. But if it's the subject of the sentence, we have to use the word der in front of it. The boy. As opposed to the dog, den Hund, as the object. Specifically, the direct object of the sentence. We'll see in a minute why this is important to have these markers. 
Oh, wait. The same sentence, the boy sees the dog. But it, it, it's the same in English. But if you look at it, the subject and the object are in different places. Der Junge is still the subject. We still are describing the boy as seeing the dog. Den Hund is the direct object. Why did I put it before that? And the reason for that is because in German it's possible to have your direct object come before the subject. And it happens in a specific context that's really to be discussed a little bit later and on a per case basis. But take my word for it, it's okay to put direct object in front of subject sometimes. Therefore, if I didn't have this distinction between der and den, I wouldn't know whether it was the dog that's seeing the boy or the boy seeing the dog. Because I have these markers, I know who is doing what. Again, this isn't very relevant to us in English because we have a very fixed or, uh, word order, subject and then the direct object. It's a little bit more flexible in German. So we still need to see, uh, we still need to know who is seeing whom. Article der applies to the subject and the article den applies to the direct object. And I get into this whole, you've seen it pretty much here, the case essentially is talking about the role of a certain word, specifically nouns. We know that the boy is the subject, and it's masculine. So, looking at it from a grammar uh, point of view, every time we have a noun that is both the subject and it's masculine, we assign the word der to it. The other, other genders in there, feminine and neutral, in addition to masculine, also have articles assigned to them. Feminine is die, neutral is das. And here's a cool little chart of how they look. Der, die, and das. Der, masculine. Die, feminine. Das is neutral. By now you've probably seen through the examples that der, die, das and for that matter, the other one that I used in the sentence, den, which I'll get to in a little bit, they all mean the word the. In English, we just say the in front of a noun. The table, the chair, the car, the man, whatever. We don't have to worry about gender. In German, you do. Every noun has a gender. Now, these three articles, der, die, and das, they are used for each individual gender but all of these are being used now as the subject so if I wanted to start my sentence off for example to talk about the boy walks down the street boy is masculine so I would say der Junge the boy if I was talking about a bag Tasche which is feminine I would have to begin my sentence with di Tasha. If I wanted to talk about the book, Buch is neutral. So I would have to begin my sentence with das Buch. All mean the. And all of these are being used right now to define the subject of the sentence, the role of the sentence. Now the grouping of all of these articles, because they share one thing in common, that they represent the subject of the sentence. We're going to put them in one group and classify them grammatically as one particular case. And that case, that fancy word, is the nominative case. So whenever you see nominative case, and maybe some of you have already seen this as you're looking through your textbooks or your teachers have shown you this, um, it just means that it's the subject of the sentence. And these three articles are applied to the beginning of nouns depending on what gender the noun is. So if we kind of put it all together, we want to use a noun as the subject, then we refer to the articles in the nominative case. There are articles in the nominative case. Der for masculine, die for feminine, das for neutral. Which one do we use? Well, that depends on the noun. We choose one of the three based on the gender. Again, I showed you that Junge, boy, was masculine. 
So we'd, we would assign der, der Junge. Tasche, a bag, is feminine, so we would have to say die Tasche. Book, Buch, is neutral, das. It happens like this in other cases too, and let me show you how this works. Now recall our second example. We have der Junge as the subject still. We know it's the subject because it's der. We look at, okay, we want to say that the boy sees the dog. So let, me, let me think. I've got der, die, and das as my articles for the nominative case, which means the subject. And I know Junge is masculine, so I have to pick out the masculine one. There it is, der. Der Junge. And we also see that Hund, remember it's also masculine, it's changed a little bit to Dean, and that's because it's the direct object. I won't get into, into it too much, but the direct object also has a fancy case name, and it's called the accusative case. So essentially, different roles of nouns in the sentence equal different cases. So each case is going to have each one of the genders assigned to it. One last example to bring this all together here. Um, let me show you how we can manipulate this a little bit. Before we used den Hund when using the dog as the direct object. Remember it was the boy sees the dog. The dog is the direct object. D-O means direct object, and mask is masculine. Now, suppose we want to refer to the dog as the subject. Well, that's fine. We already know which article to use for the subject, for the nominative case, when it's masculine. And it changes to der Hund. Now, the dog is the subject. It's the doer. It's the one that is seeing. Oh, and by the way, if you look at this, not only is der Hund the subject, but now we've changed it to den Junge. Hmm, Junge is masculine. Before, we used der Junge as the subject. But now it's the object, and we clearly know, because of the difference between der and den, that it's the dog that is seeing the boy. The boy is being seen here as the direct object. So I hope that kind of clarifies one very common way that cases are used in German. And that's why when you see these charts, essentially you have charts of articles and they all apply for each gender, but each set, each case, nominative, accusative, and later, as we'll see, dative and genitive case. They just mean that there's a set for each that represents each gender for each of the different roles in the sentence. We saw the two roles here as the subject and the direct object, nominative and accusative case. In part two, we'll look at a little bit more with the accusative case, and we'll probably even get uh, into the dative case a little bit, but we're going to look at how we can use these cases, these sets of ending, or these sets of articles, like de, di, das, in other ways other than just the role of a noun. So we'll get into things like prepositional phrases, certain verbs that take certain cases, and that will be part two. If you have any questions, be sure to send us an email contact us. You can even respond right below in the video if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, if you like the video, like it, pass it along, subscribe, and you can always get more videos and learning tips for German at connecttogerman.com. We'll have another video up shortly. Stay tuned.